Phew. Anybody else have one of those weeks? Maybe you're too tired to raise your hand. Just like, yeah. yeah I, I, I'll just take the head shake. It's yes, all right? You know, sometimes our weeks are just so busy. Sometimes our, our summers are so busy. How many of you have ever gone on a vacation and you came back, you were just exhausted from it? Anybody come back, you know? You know, and you tried to do everything, so you really didn't enjoy anything, but you at least could say, I had a vacation this summer, right? Woohoo, can't wait for next year, right? And there's just something about the pace of life for some of us that stretches us in so many different ways. It literally leaves us exhausted at all times. But today our, our, our question as we, we continue in this series is, what if that wasn't how it was intended to be? What if from the very beginning God kind of said, no, no, that's not the kind of pace I want you to live. There's actually a different way, a better way that's there. And it's kind of based on this idea, and if you're taking notes, this is actually the last point on your notes there. Again, it was one of those weeks, and so uh, last night I switched things up. But in our effort to get the most of life, we lose control of our life. You know, we're pulled in so many different directions, and if you're, you know, your calendar gets so filled because you got to go here and there, there's just no room to stop and take a breath. If your finances are so tight, there's just no room for, you know, kind of a, a breakdown or a broken part. You know, if, if your job is just kind of sucking so much out because, well, you know, we say to ourselves, it's, it's just the way it is right now. But if you notice how often how it is right now becomes... It's just how it is, period. And it has a huge, it has a huge effect on us. It, our stress goes up. Have you noticed that? When you're really tired, your stress goes up. You snap at somebody and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just really tired. I didn't mean to snap at you, but just be quiet for a moment, right? <laughs> and not only does our stress go up, our ability to focus goes down. Have you noticed that as well? You know, you're, you're kind of thinking, and it's like, oh, I, don't, I got to think about this now. I, don't, oh, I can't really focus. You know, just, I'll just write the check. I don't worry about if I even ordered this thing. I just, just get it done. I just want it done. I just want some peace. I just need a break. And today we're going to look at this idea that's an old, old idea that for some of you may be new, but a lot of you, uh, if you've been around New Hope, you've, you've kind of aware of this idea. But even being aware of this idea, even maybe even saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I already got this down, I'm going to guess that there was a part of this that you still may struggle with, to really fully embrace this idea that God is trying, that God so wants for, for you and I to engage with. And here's the great thing. Here's the great thing, that even if you're not a religious kind of person, you know, you're here today, you're here today because your friend's baby got dedicated, you know, and you're, hey, I'm here because... That's why I'm here, or maybe you're with, you know, here because she's kind of cute, and, you know, she's here, and you're here kind of thing, or maybe it's vacation last, you know, getting down there, and you're here visiting family or friends. Whatever the case is, the great thing about what we're going to talk about today is it works for your life. You don't have to be a religious person to kind of understand this concept and actually begin to practice this concept, because this is really sort of a, a pace of life thing more than it is simply a, a religious thing. So before we go, jump in to this next part, I invite you to bow your heads, and let's pray together one more time, all right? Father, all I can do is go, phew. For me, it's been an incredibly busy week of meetings and appointments and schedules and things to get done and things to get solved. And I just want to enjoy just for a moment the ability to rest in your presence The ability to let my soul catch up with my life. And today, I ask that you would speak to us again. But more than having you speak to us, I pray that, uh, that we would listen. And even more importantly than listen, that we would do. That we would obey, that we would respond. To your good and wonderful gifts that you give us in our lives. That so often we're so busy or so self-focused that we miss. And so today in this space and in this place, we invite you in to, to move us, to 
shape us, to guide us, and most importantly, to love us and to accept us. We thank you for that in your name. Amen. We talked about this concept a couple weeks ago, that a big part of what drives our life is fear. Fear. Remember, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. And let's see just again if this resonates with it. How many of you ever have a fear of missing out? You're the kind of person that never leaves the party early because you might miss something, right? You know, because, hey, somebody might say something. Somebody might talk about something. Maybe there'll be a picture that I can post later. You know, I just don't want to miss anything out. And so, you know, we don't want our kids to miss out on anything. So we got them in dance lessons. We got them in music lessons. We got them in sports stuff. We got them in after school stuff. If there was morning stuff, we'd have them in morning stuff because we don't want them to miss out because I don't want to be a bad parent. You know, so I want to have them every opportunity. And that fear drives us to somebody. Not only the fear of missing out, we have the fear of falling behind. You know, I gotta keep up. I gotta keep up with everybody. And I'm afraid that if I don't keep that pace, I'm gonna get behind and then I'm gonna be at a gathering. I'm gonna be at one of those great reunion gatherings. How many, how many of you actually have gone back to a high school reunion? Anybody? Yeah, not a very big group. There's a reason for that. Especially the longer you've been away from that group, unless you were a really close group, it's like, why am I going to go see these people? I don't like them in high school. What's going to make me think I'm going to like them now, you know? <laughs> but we're afraid, you know? And in, fact, in fact, the very first uh, uh, reunion you have after high school, everybody wants to go back, you know? Everybody wants to be in shape, or, or their second, you know, their tenure, I want to be in shape. I want to have more hair than I have, so I'll go get a wig, you know? I, I get that spray on tan. You know, I'll go rent that Maserati so it looks like baby. You know? But it's that fear, you know, and that fear drives us to do lots of crazy stuff. It, it causes us to extend our schedules. It causes us to extend our finances. Something else, another fear that drives us is the fear of losing faith. And I think this is especially, especially for you women. Because you, all you women, are super women, Right? Let's hear from the women. Yeah, you can tell they were tired today. <laughs> and I would have expected somebody to stand up, right? But no, that's, that's right. I understand. But, you know, there's this huge expectations, right? I mean, if you're, if you, if you're single, you know, you've got to be great, great at the top of your career. You've got to be there. You've got to show that, that a woman can fit in this marketplace. And if you're married, then you've got somebody else you've got to take care of. Because if you're married to a guy, it's like having a kid, you know. You've got you to clean up after him, you know. But you've got to, you know, you got to have a, If you have kids, you have more kids in that family, right? And there's this fear of, of losing faith. Because if I, if I say I can't do this, everybody's going to go, oh, come on, you've got to do this. And, and this, this fear of losing faith drives us to, to say yes to everything. To do more and more and more and more. Not only losing faith, there's the fear of not mattering. I know for me as a guy that this is a big thing. You know, when I leave this planet, when I die, I want people to miss me. I want some of you crying, you know? I don't want any hallelujahs, praise you Jesus kind of things. I want, you know, you want to have done something that, that, that made a big enough difference that, that, that you mattered. And so in order to matter, sometimes we don't want to miss out on those opportunities to matter. And so we feel like we've got to be all these different places, do all this different kind of stuff, take on all this stuff because I'm afraid that I won't matter. But here's the crazy thing. You know what I think is the biggest fear that drives our life? And I'm not talking just to those of you today with us or watching online someplace that aren't kind of religious kind of people, followers of Jesus. I'm talking about you who are followers of Jesus. We have a huge fear of God. Which is why we sing these great words and we're moved with the songs. There are moments every day of your week that that fear of God drives you to do something. In fact, the, the thing we're going to look at today is, is very much that. I mean, God kind of introduced this years ago when he talks about this. In fact, let me get a little background. This is, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is Moses is going to be talking to the, the Israelites, this group of people that we call the Israelites. This is a group of people that, that Moses has, has freed from Egypt. 
And in this freedom thing, they're, they're being freed not just because they were sort of, you know, prisoners there. They're being freed because they were slaves there. That all started good, but went bad. And for hundreds of years, they have been slaves. You know, your, 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 your dad was a slave, your mom was a slave, your grandparents were slaves, your great-grandparents were slaves, your great-great... I mean, everybody's been slaves for, for lots of years. And so into that, that group of people, before now, they've gone through the wilderness. This version is that, that Moses is kind of saying, hey, before we enter the promised land, let me remind you again of all the stuff that God told us to do and not to do. And there's a reason that God told them to do stuff and not to do stuff, because they had been slaves for so long that all they understood was slave rules. And you know what slave rules were simply? Do your work, do it well, shut up. Three things, pretty simple, Caesar, right? Do your work, do it well, and shut up. And that's what they had learned. And so they needed, when they were saying that we're going to become this new nation, we're now going to have to figure out how this works because we don't have mass anymore. We don't have these expectations anymore. Well, what do we have expectations of? And so it's into that culture a culture that we have a hard time understanding, even though we have a history of slavery here in the U.S. We don't have that long of a history of it. And we don't understand sort of the, the, the consistent brutality. I mean, in that, in that culture, your value was based on what you could produce. And if you could not produce, you had no value. You were worth nothing. It was all about producing, producing, producing. And while we may not understand that as a, as a slave mentality, we do understand that as a work mentality, don't we? Because I'm guessing a lot of you work in positions where the bottom line is producing, right? Getting results, getting things figured out, getting stuff repaired, getting stuff fixed, getting stuff answered. And so we can appreciate at least a little bit of this idea about producing. And it's into that kind of setting that, that, that Moses says, hey folks, I want to remind you again of something we've known for a while now because God said it back when we're out in the middle of the wilderness. In fact, even before he said it, sort of in these big Ten Commandments kind of thing, he gave us an example of it even before that and how he fed us. But here's, the, here's Moses' take in the Deuteronomy version of it when he says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord has commanded you. Now, this is not new to them, and for a lot of you in this room, it's not new to you. You kind of know about the Sabbath. You've heard about the Sabbath. You, you've maybe been a Sabbath keeper from your perspective for a long time in your life. But for them, this was earth-shattering. Because for them, to take a day off put your life at risk. Because this was before refrigeration. This was before fast food. I know, kids, it's hard to imagine. This is before grocery stores, you know, Safeway and Giant and Harris Teeter and Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. This is before those little, little convenience stores at the gas station where they have those hot dogs and you don't know how long they've been there. <laughs> but this is way before any of that time. And so if you didn't produce it today, if you didn't go dig it up, if you didn't go cut it off, if you didn't, you know, kill something... You were going to be hungry today. You might die. And for God to come along and say, folks, here's how it's going to work. And I want you to preserve this. I don't want you to miss out on this. You need to take a day off. But what if we thought about it a different way? I mean, how can you not love a God who says, I, I, I want you to take a day off so much that I'm going to command you to take a day off? Some of you work in jobs, you wish your boss would kind of understand that and say, I'm commanding you, do not come to work tomorrow. Well, please, boss, may I have another. You know, you, you just want to. But here God says, I'm commanding you. This is so important. I'm commanding you to take a day off. To which they had to say, but what about? What, what if we don't get it all done? I'd say, trust me on this. But what if we don't get it all finished? Trust me on this. What if we don't get all the crops, you know? Cropped, I was going to say, but that's not the right term. Crops. Harvested, yeah. What if we don't get all the crops harvested? Don't worry about it. Trust me on this. Because this commandment and his call for us to observe it is a reminder again 
that God thinks this is so important to your life that he made it not just one of the top ten, he made it number four on the top ten biggest hits for him. And the part we forget, especially those of us that have have been Sabbath keepers for a, a portion of our life, the part we forget is the next part. We get to kind of observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. We're not really sure about that, but okay, we understand day kind of thing. And then he goes on and says, listen, you have six days each week for your ordinary work, to which we think, holy God, I get every weekend off. I only have five days to do my ordinary work, right? We were actually in a better situation. If God says to them, hey, listen, you got six days, but the seventh day is, this, is a Sabbath day of rest. It's dedicated to the Lord your God. It's a, it's a day of rest. In fact, in their culture, what they understood and what was kind of based as, as Moses kind of figured this thing out was that on Friday night, when the sun goes down, all your work stops. And whatever you left then, you can pick up Saturday night when the sun comes back up. But during that 24 hours for them, a whole culture was based on this. And we'll talk about it in a minute when we see what Jesus said about it. But in this whole culture, it was based on this idea, Friday night comes in, everything stops. And it was this reminder that I don't need to hold on to things. That I can step back from things. That I can wait for things. But he goes on. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, which we ought ought to say, Really? <laughs> that ought to be good news. See, that ought to be good news, right? I don't got to do any work. Woo! You know, right? But then Moses kind of takes it, reminds us that he kind of goes a step farther. Not only you, but your sons and daughters, to which some of you are thinking, you know, they're at that age where it's like, hey, if they don't do any work, it's not going to make any difference around here today, right? <laughs> your male or female servants, which most of us don't have, Right? But, but he's saying, listen, this goes beyond just you. This is a day for you, but it's more than just you. And sometimes we forget that. It's, it's more than just about me. It's about me. It's about my kids. It's about my, my servants. It's about your oxen and your donkeys and your other livestock. I don't know if cats and dogs made that list and other livestock, but, but he's saying, listen, this goes beyond just humans. This is everything. I, don't, I, want, I think everything needs a break. And any foreigners living among you, And we all know what foreigners living among us, the jobs that most foreigners living among us typically do, right? I grew up in the West Coast. We called them migrant workers. What do we call them here on the East Coast? Oh. <laughs> Who knew we called them the same thing, right? But, they, you know, they tend to be, you know, they're, they're here. They tend to take any kind of job. They tend to have these really hardworking jobs where they don't make a lot of money, but they work a lot harder than a lot of us do, if we're honest about it, Right? And he says, even those people, the people who are just kind of scraping by because now you're going to be in a better situation, even they deserve a break today. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. He has to repeat that because they might have missed it. They might have just focused on, hey, it's my day of a break. He said, no, 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 it's all your people. And then Moses gives a different reason for this whole thing. In the Ten Commandments, the, the... the the ones that come down from heaven that God writes with his hand, that version says, hey, because from the very beginning, this is how God had it. But now Moses, he's retelling the story to folks before they go into this promised land. As Remember again, they've been slaves for all these years. Everybody says the slave mentality. Now they're changing their idea. Now he says, listen, remember, remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. Remember that life was not just tough, it was bad. Remember That you never had a moment. You had no idea what a weekend was. Because there was no weekend for them. They had no long weekends. They had no vacation. They had no sick days. They had no mental health days. Because boss, I'm just just not feeling it today. To which the boss would have said, let me help you feel it, right? You know, we'll we'll, kind of get this thing worked out. But remember... Don't forget what you once were. And don't forget that the Lord your God brought you out with a strong hand and powerful arm. Don't forget the reason you're no longer slaves has nothing to do with you, but has everything to do with him. That is why, because you once were slaves, but you're no longer slaves because of what he's done, that is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. And here's our challenge. For those of us that are followers of Jesus in this room, those of us that are sort of Sabbath-keeping 
Adventists, Adventists in this room, we hear, when we hear this command, we hear slow down. Isn't that right? We need to slow down a little bit. I can put the brakes on too hard. I want to come to a complete stop, but I'm going to slow down just a little bit, right? When in reality, this commandment is saying this. So turn to the person on uh, either side of you and say, stop. stop. Now say it like you mean it. Stop. Not, 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 not that much you mean it, Sandra. Is it? <laughs> hey, you know, calm down a little. Stop. In fact, that's literally what that word Sabbath, the, the, the root of it literally means not just rest. We've heard rest a lot. It means rest, but it means more than rest. It means come to a complete stop when you come to the stop sign. Not one of those kind of California stops. That's what we call them, California. Not one of those Maryland, we don't even have a California stop here. This is a stop. Put it in park, turn the engine off. Stop kind of thing, not a, hey, revving, waiting for my opportunity to get back engaged. And when we miss that, we miss what God is talking about in this commandment. Because the reality is, all of us here today and all of us watching online at wherever we're at, all of us need to And we need to do it not just because it's commanded, but it's kind of cool that God knew we needed enough to say, listen, this is so important for you, I'm going to make it one of my top ten. Because you need to always remember, you need to stop. See, the Sabbath teaches us that we are more than what we do. For them, it was what they did. And every day they had to provide, and God had to kind of take them through. In fact, if you want a great thing to read this afternoon, go back to Exodus, read before the Ten Commandments are even there, when God does this thing where he, he teaches them about the Sabbath through this gift of food, this idea of manna. I mean, they're out in the desert. They had no food. They had no grocery stores. They got no place to, to get something to feed all these people. And so God says, I'll take care of it. Every day you get some food. Except on Saturdays, because on Saturdays you've got to get twice the amount of food on Fridays, because on Saturdays I don't want you going out and getting any food. To which the people said, okay, and on that first Saturday, you know what they did? They went out to look for food, that's right. Even though they had twice, you know, they had leftovers from the day before. And the other thing that God taught them in that whole thing was that what you did today, what you produced today, what you got today, isn't good for tomorrow. That every day, you had to rely on him. See, and the Sabbath is really all about it. It's about this idea of, will we trust God? Well, I trust God. Will you trust God? And it teaches us that we are more than what we do. But more than it teaches us that we're more than what we do, notice this, it teaches us that we are less than we believe. Because some of us in this room, while we say, oh yes, God, we kind of take a lot of his roles for ourselves. I mean, think about it for a minute. Let's be, be honest just with yourself. I don't want you to be honest with anybody else because you won't. But how many times have something come up in your life and you thought, I got this. I can handle this. I'm not going to bother God with this. You know, I'll pray that he gives me strength or gives me some wisdom to figure, you know, go through this. But I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to get through this because, hey. And what if the Sabbath is really trying to teach us not only that we're, we're not just what we do, but that we are less than what we believe. See, behind this idea of stopping on the Sabbath is this. Not just you, but yes, your son, your daughter, your servants, whether they're male or female. All that livestock that you have in your backyard right now, you need to give a break to. All those foreigners, the migrant workers, you need to give a break to. Because when God calls us into this idea of stopping and experience rest, he's also asking us to, to give it a rest, to give that rest to everybody else around him. See, sometimes, you know, let me get a little history, if you're not familiar with, with our church, that we have a long history of trying to decide what work looks like. And we're not new with that. The, uh, the uh, Jews, as they kind of grappled with this, they had something like 39 things you weren't supposed to do on the Sabbath. We have our own versions. How many of you ever heard the, the, the discussion about how much water 
changes from refreshing to being work. Anybody else heard that kind of discussion? You know, is it the ankle? Is it the knee? Is it halfway up the thigh? You know, is it the neck? I mean, what, what portion? We kind of get all caught up in this stuff. And the Bible's simply clear on this. It says, listen, you're not supposed to work. Not you, not anybody sort of in your family, not anybody you employ, not, not anybody, and you're not supposed to buy or sell. That's kind of because if I'm making, buying or selling, you're making your work. But everything else, there's nothing else in the Bible that talks about what it is or what it isn't. And so we have to kind of figure out what work looks like and what it doesn't look like. And what it is that we need to give a rest in our life. I, lo- I love this other, uh, back in Exodus, when Moses kind of talked about this as well, just a little short thing. He says another thing about the Sabbath. He said, listen, you should work six days a week, but on the seventh day you must rest. That is, you must stop. You must stop. This lets your ox and your donkey rest, because they need to rest, and it also lets the slave born in your house and the foreign, and as the resident alien, the migrant worker, be refreshed as well. What God is after in this commandment is that we would be refreshed. And what refreshes you may be different from what refreshes me. But it also has something I have to extend to others as well. See, this commandment isn't just about me focused. It's about others focused. Because at our core, all of us, everybody in this room, we are all selfish. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I am selfish. You can finish the line. Yeah, selfish, yeah. And you may be kind of, he doesn't know me. Listen, I I know you. (laughs) I know you enough that when there's a group photo taken, you want to look and see how that photo is, and the very first person you look at in that photo, and if it's a bad photo, you know what you say? Oh, I might have it back. Let's let's take let's take this again, right? <laughs> and this commandment is calling us beyond the selfishness. So this is not just a me thing that I get a day of break. I got a love of God who get, who commands me to take a vacation. You know, woohoo! But this is about no, no. It's about others, and it's about valuing others in our lives, and it's about valuing others enough to look for to understand, and to offer to them rest as well. In fact, Jesus, Jesus captures this in a, in a way that kind of makes us a little uncomfortable. Like when Jesus says this, when you first hear how Jesus sort of cast this whole thing, because he's talking to a group of people that understood the Sabbath. He's talking to a group of people that understood there were 39 rules of things you weren't supposed to do, and they kept kind of adding variations to them. He was speaking to a group of people whose, whose life was based on this idea of work sick days, Friday night comes, everything gets shut off, everything gets turned down, we, we don't do anything for 24 hours, and then we're back into it. He says, into that group, I want you to listen to what he says, and it can be sound insensitive when he first says it. He says, don't worry. And for some of you, when you think about this idea of the Sabbath, this idea of not working, not making anybody else work, you think, hmm, but what about, and what if, to which Jesus would say, don't worry about it. In fact, don't worry about the food. Don't worry about the drink you need to live. Don't worry about the clothes you need for your body. To which some of us say, well, if I don't worry about it, Jesus, who's going to worry about it, right? I mean, do you see how some of these other people are dressed today? I mean, some, somebody ought to be worried about this stuff, right? But Jesus simply says, listen, don't worry. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. And we all know that on one level. But there's another part of us, the fear part of us, that goes, but Jesus, I need a roof over my house. I need some food in my belly. I need some, some clothes and then Jesus hits this group of religious people in a place that, that, that nobody else could have. Because he looks at this group of religious people and he says to them this. Listen, folks. The people who don't know God, those pagans, 
The people that don't know the God, like you say you know the God, that, those kind of people, they keep trying to get, that is they run after these things. They run after the food, they run after the drink, they're, close, you know, they're, they're praying to their gods, you know, you know, harvest gods, whatever, produce, produce, produce for us. He says, listen, that's how those people do it. That's not how you people ought to be doing it because you know God. And then he says the thing, that if we're honest, it's so hard for us not only to hear, but to believe. Your Father in heaven knows you need them. God is not unaware of what goes on in your life. And we're a little afraid of that. Because there are times in our lives when we think, you know what? Hello? Seems like you're a little unaware of what's going on here. And I'll give you a daily update report, you know. I need this fixed, that fixed, you know. The plumbing's leaking, the car's broken down again. You know, when's that new car going to show up, you know, and, and that job, the job is driving me crazy. How often do I have to pray, you know? I know I'm supposed to love my enemies, pray for them, but I've been praying for them, and I'd love it if they left. And I really love my enemies, God, but where? Where are you at in this thing? To which Jesus says, listen, don't worry. Your Father in heaven knows. And then he says these words. Seek first, that is before. Seek first as opposed to what you've been doing. Seek first, that is be concerned above all else with God's kingdom and what God wants, that is his righteousness. That we need to change the course of our lives if we're gonna call ourselves followers of his, which means we have to follow after him. We have to follow after the things he asks us, the things he directs us to. And he throws in this great last line, Dave. He says, listen, then all your other needs will be met as well. I mean, don't worry about those things like God's going to say, oh, just seek me, you know, you're going to have to live out of back, you know, live in a van down by the river, that's going to be your life, you know. That's not the point here. God's aware of these things, and he's going to take care of it. But, but, but for us, it's about what we're seeking first. What we're thinking about first. What we're doing first. And the sad thing for a lot of us is the first thing we think about is our schedule, or our job, or our finances, or our frustrations, or all the other stuff that's going on. And we just think, this is just a phase. When I get through this, then I can do. To which Jesus says, no, no, no. Stop. Stop. Give it a rest. Don't worry about that stuff. If I know, if, if our Father knows all this stuff, He knows all this stuff. In fact, Jesus said something else that we don't often associate with the Sabbath, but in those, their minds, the, the Jewish people's minds, it would have been clear to them that this was all about the Sabbath because Jesus mentions rest when He talks about this, and for them, rest equaled Sabbath. There would have been no, no disconnect there. But he's talking about the Sabbath when he made this incredible statement one day. In fact, I know he's talking about the Sabbath because all the stuff that follows, all the stuff that follows in Matthew is about the Sabbath. He'll talk about how his disciples were getting hassled because they were getting some, something to eat on Sabbath. They were picking some wheat. But when Jesus says, come, come to me, that's an invitation for us to move in his direction. Come to me, come along with me, come experience this Sabbath thing, because it's come, come to me, all of you who are tired, how many of you are tired today? Anybody weary? I love that word, it's a better word, weary. It just sounds heavy when you say it, right? Everybody say weary with me. Right? It just make you, it makes you tired just saying it, right? Weary, I'm just weary. And have heavy loads, anybody have heavy loads today? You're overburdened, another one of those great words, you know, burdened, it just sounds like you're pulling yourself down. Come to me. Anybody who feels that way, and you know what? I will give you rest. And the challenge for all of us is, will we accept rest on his terms? 
will rest have to be on our terms? See, the Sabbath is not a, a wasted day. The Sabbath is not a catch up on my sleep day because I've been stretching myself way too long the rest of the week. The Sabbath is a day to remind ourselves just what that group of former slaves had to remind themselves in the wilderness. That I can trust God. I can trust God even with all my what ifs or what abouts or how's this going to work out. I mean, if I don't do it today, when am I going to get to it? To which God just simply says, Trust me on this. See, the reality is, someone or something is going to determine the limits you live by. Someone or something is going to determine the limits you live by. In fact, you already know that. Some of you are very aware that you are limited by your bank account, right? Or you are limited by the amount of money you, you bring in every month. Some of you recognize that you are, you, you are, your limits are determined by your calendar. There just is not enough space in that thing to write on all the stuff, right? Some of you, in fact, have gone to the computerized one because you can get lots and lots of stuff, and that little paper one doesn't work any longer. But here's my question. I want to be straight with you as we close today. Are you willing to be limited by God's design for a pace of life Or will you allow culture to drive your limits? A culture that tells us all you can do more, you can be more, you can have more, you just need to do more and be more and have more. Or will you let your limits be set by your fears? I'm afraid to get behind, afraid of losing face, I'm afraid of missing out, and so I gotta, that'll be my limit, I just keep kind of go, go, go. Or will you allow God to determine that limit? Because when Moses reminds this group of people that they're to observe this day, he's reminding them that God has put a limit, that, 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 that there's always going to be limits. But in order to, to trust God, we have to allow him to be. And we, have to allow, we have to be willing to trust him in the way that he invites us to trust him. Because when he says, come to me, he's saying, come to me on my terms, his terms, not our terms. And so today, I hope again that you will not only have listened, but that you'll be willing to do, that you'll be willing to obey, that you would be willing, at least maybe not for the rest of your life, but maybe for for just today, or maybe today is too quick for you, maybe next Saturday, that you would try observing the Sabbath in the way that he described it. A way, a place to stop, that you would give it a rest, and not only for yourself, but for others as well.